Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and supporting the Historical Society. First, a big thank you ahead of time to Greg Harrison, our videographer, who uh, puts everything we do on YouTube. And if you want access to the links, just go to our website, and you can go click on the link, and you can see any of our past talks. And it's uh, wonderful to have this service. Woodstock Community Television provides it. Thank you. Um, also, a little bit of a shout out to uh, Max, the man that wrote the art, excuse me, the woman, woman that wrote the article in the Vermont Standard last week, the big promo. For the, it was excellent. So if anybody's in doubt, by the end of this, you'll really know what you're listening to. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I'd like to welcome Cindy back to Bridgewater. I'm sure you remember her talk from last year on Grace Coolidge. Today, she's going to speak on a neglected part of Vermont's history. These are the stories of women, African Americans, Native Americans, all Vermonters, whose history has largely been forgotten and rarely mentioned in schools or publications. She has published a book on the topic and uses it for her coursework. So we welcome Cindy. And um, a little promo next month, September 27th, Sunday, we'll have John Atwood talking about her. 29th, we'll have John Atwood talking about Vermont pipe organs. So this month we have Cindy, and next month we'll have John. So thank you. And also, can, oh, first of all, can people hear me? Yes, yes? OK. Um, also, for those of you who are a little bit older, I was the person who ran Coolidge Foundation for 18 years. And um, my commute from Hanover, New Hampshire, was right through here. So I saw the building forever. So it's nice to finally get in the building and get to know some of the folks here. And it's really nice to, uh, that they invite me to come back. Um, I really miss the area uh, very, very much. I miss the Coolidge family, which uh, how many of you got to know the Coolidge family? Anybody here? Yeah, a few did, yes. Yeah. Um, so it's nice, nice to be back um, in this uh, area. Um, I did write, write this book, uh, and, and it's now getting a little age to it. Um, that was 12 years ago when I wrote this book. And at this point, I even might, if I went back and rewrote the book, I'd even change the title. Because now we don't call Native Americans Native Americans, we call them indigenous people, right? And now we don't call African Americans African Americans. We now say people of color or blacks. So look at how much change in these, in these few years since I wrote the book. Um, however, the book is accurate. And despite the um, names, uh, everything pretty much stands up. So those of you who are still buying the book, um, I encourage you to do that. I still use it in my classes. I'm still teaching community. College of Vermont students, Vermont history. Um, of course, some of them don't know how old I am. And they, they make cracks about, this is online, and they make cracks about, well, we think judges should really retire at age 60, and things like that. <laughs> and one student this semester said, I want to write about how presidents should not be over 65, <laughs> and all of that. And they kind of are oblivious to, to ages. But anyhow, I started the book with some poetry and, and, and trying to uh, get into some of the points. Some of you are aware of where the Abenaki were in, this, in New England. But many historical societies do not begin their timelines with anything to do with the Abenaki. And as much as I really think this is a great Bridgewater Historical Society, you're a little like my Hanover Historical Society. Don't have a lot on Abenaki yet. So I encourage you, you invited me to come and speak, so I'm helping, helping a little bit here. But I encourage you to put more on uh, and to invite some speakers that know a lot of this history. I think, it's, I think it's great, and we're all obligated to do more of that. And that's why I put the map up there. But one person you probably have heard of is Susanna Johnson. How many of you have heard of her? No, not so many. OK, well, then I'll tell you her story. She was an eyewitness to the Abenaki, and rather famous because she gave birth in Reading, Vermont, went right in the middle of her march to Canada in 1754. As I wrote in my book, 
she and her husband were all packed up and ready to leave when Native Americans came to her home. Eleven of them woke her up. She was got, about to give birth. She did give birth in Reading, and she was still forced to continue on to Canada. She was given a horse, and she used the horse until they were so starved they had to eat the horse. She put her faith in God. She was quite religious, and her religion um, colored her point of view. She did get to Odenac, the St. Francis village, which was on the St. Francis River, about 90 miles north of Lake Memphremagog. Her narrative stated that for 45 days she lived there and then she wrote about the wigwams and how the Native Americans went to church and they were pretty serious about that and she wrote of her judgment in, in her uh, uh, narrative here. She called them children of nature and they were much kinder than the French jailers she later had to live, uh, live with because she was jailed. She appreciated Native Americans when they shared their food, even when famine stared them in the face. And they adopted captives. They adopted her son, Sylvanus. You'll read about him in my book. And they called them brothers and sisters. So uh, there is a commemoration. How many of you have seen it? OK, one has seen it. Good. <laughs> OK. Um, she returned to the place of her daughter's birth and in 1796 published her narrative. And then in 1799, she came back and she had these two slate markers made and placed there. So if you go, if you want to find these markers, go up to Route 106 near the junction of Knapp Brook Road in Reading and you can find them. So maybe that's a field trip. Polly might want to take some time. Now returning to history again, remember Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys and my students love reading about him. Well, he and his brothers didn't want to recognize any Native American presence in the Republic of Vermont because to be part of this United States, or the part of joining the new, new area, the Republic of Vermont would have had to settle all Indian claims. Remember, Vermont was a republic from 1777 to 1791. So the Allens suggested that Natives just traveled through Vermont they didn't really live in Vermont, so that Vermont would be eligible to be a 14th state. And that's where we get into that story. We now have archaeological evidence of the presence of the Abenaki. The person who did the most research on this, I give credit to, is Gordon Day. Now, can you see this slide? Is it too light? No. Can we, should we shut a curtain or what? No? OK, well, think about that. Gordon, while well, I'm talking about Gordon Day, uh, he had grown up in Albany, Vermont. He had known Abenaki children. His research was carried on by the Havilands and Powers of UVM and Colin Calloway of Dartmouth. And I suggest, now is that better, do you think? Yes. Yeah. I suggest you read their books and also you can check with the Winter Center for Indigenous Traditions. Uh, for more information on Native American history. <coughs> of course, since I mentioned to you good old Calvin, um, Calvin wrote in his autobiography that his great-grandmother was Native American, and he saw his great-aunt smoking a clay pipe. But since he was out of office when he wrote his autobiography, Nobody did much about this. And this is somewhat of a joke slide for you because this is when he was visiting the Sioux. It had nothing to do with Vermont. But this is to remind us that he did openly say that he had some uh, heritage of uh, Abenaki, Native American, and that he had seen evidence with one of his great aunts. And I did some research the other day to see if that was possible, if he had lived at the time that she lived. And yes, he did overlap with one of his uh, great aunts, and he, was, it, he did see her smoking the pipe. So this is also kind of interesting. What did, it's a, that didn't get much attention. What did get attention was the eugenics movement. Now, somebody, some of you have heard about this. There is a new book on this, but my, the book that I relied on for my book was uh, Nancy Gallagher, 
and she wrote Be Breeding Better Vermonters. And basically, in 1928, Vermont created a commission on country life to analyze the condition of the state. The commissioners asserted that the Yankee Protestant tradition and heritage would be a model for future development. Are you getting that? Old Vermont stock should be preserved and not mixed with natives or French Canadians. One reason they wanted to do this study was that when Vermonters were given physicals to sign up for World War I, some were found deficient in body mass and health. What was wrong with those farm boys? Well, Professor Henry, uh, Harry Perkins, right here, um, wanted to study this. And he learned of the germplasm theory. Quote, one's biological potential became constrained by the immutable germplasm of one's ancestors, which no amount of striving, healthy living, or education could change. Are you getting that? In other words, you inherit these defects. That was his theory. Now, if some of you are saying this is kind of eerie, this is kind of like Nazi Germany, you're kind of right. Mm -hmm. um, this was very intolerant. Uh, he and his social work uh, colleagues found 4,600 people with elements that seemed to encourage defectiveness, crime, and pauperism. These low-grade, I'm using quotes here, low-grade Vermonters should be relegated to mental institutions and then sterilized. He drafted a sterilization law to apply to those with these inherited defects. The law passed in 1931, and the case files in the archives, and I did go to the archives. I always check my research. Even though um, Nancy Gallagher did all this research, I also went to the archives. And I must tell you, um, it's a very scary uh, experience. I, I called for the archives, some of them to be pulled out. I read through some of the uh, descriptions of the people and what they found wrong with them, and it was a lot of racism and intolerance, and not liking someone's lifestyle. There was a lot of that in there, and it really, I must say, made me ill, and I didn't go back again. It was just too much. Uh, but Nancy Gallagher, and a, now a new researcher, has done an awful lot of work on this. Um, at least 20 Native Americans were sterilized in 1946 at the Brandon Training School, and sterilization was often the condition for you to get released. Um, one of the textbooks says about 200 sterilizations must have been performed. And the law was in place till 1981, which is kind of shocking, isn't it? The governor who signed this believed this would reduce poverty and um, reduce the need for government services since poor and disabled people could no longer have children. The eugenics program did single out Native Americans as undesirable. It is not surprising that Native Americans have had a low profile. And when I did some of my research, I talked to some Native Americans, and they said, you know, Cindy, we, we did not want to say we were Native American or Abenaki or anything because of the fear of the eugenics program. So many of them will share that with you. We, they did not want to come forward. So. It, it, now it fits in, this puzzle is being put together for us. This is why the history books didn't have much, because they weren't given much material um, to even work with. OK, things all changed when Homer St. Francis and his friends began fish-ins. Now, do any of you remember the fish-ins? Yeah, some of you are nodding. It was a civil protest. He was the chief of the St. Francis Sokokai Band, and they wanted free fishing licenses and unlimited access to fishing on the Missisquoi River near Swanton. After all, the Federal Wildlife Refuge had been opened to them before it was made a federal property in 1943. St. Francis demanded that the federal government leave their lands. That didn't happen, but programs were begun to help. In 1980, the high school dropout rate for Native American children in Vermont was 70%. Less than 5% who stayed in school went to college. Programs were finally developed to address this. And then in the 1990s, Abenaki youth had a 3% dropout rate, with 50% going on to college. 
Now there is more pride in being Native American. When I had some classes at CCV a few years ago, I said, do any of you have any heritage? You, you don't say blood anymore, you're aware of that. Any heritage of Native Americans? And about half the class put their hands up and said, we're very proud of this. And I went, okay, things have really changed because people are willing to talk about this. Of course, recognition of their tribal bands are important. They'd like, to, many Native Americans who are making crafts would like their crafts to be uh, considered quite authentic. They can also apply for federal housing grants. And in 2006, the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs was created with a path for recognition. Finally, in 2011, we have, I'm just showing you the list of the four bands. And in 2011, you, this is Governor Shumlin, and he is standing with the El Nu and Nelhegan Nel leaders. You can go back and see where they are. Okay, and just fairly recently, Governor Scott did sign a bill allowing certified citizens of the indigenous tribes to get free fishing licenses. Isn't that interesting how long this took? In Vermont, sometimes you've noticed it takes a long time to get something. Or a free combination of hunting and fishing. Tribal citizens just have to submit their ID card. It's, and this is a quote from Chief Don Stevens. It's a milestone, basically, in Vermont's history. They have now acknowledged and recognized the fact that the Abenaki has always retained its rights to hunt and fish in our territories. And Chief Stevens is from the Nahogan Band, and they're in the Northeast Kingdom. Also, property owned by Vermont-recognized uh, American tribes will be exempt from property taxes. The land must be used for purposes of the tribe. Four properties lie in Barton, Brattleboro, Swanton, and Brunswick Springs. But it's not all, here it's another map for you. It's not all wonderful. Two years ago, some presenters from the Odenac First Nation and Abenaki Reserve in Quebec, Canada, were invited to the University of Vermont to share their views of Vermont and Quebec history. These individuals used to support the Abenakis but in the early 2000s, question the validity of these claims. I don't know if some of you have heard this. This is basically the group that did uh, want Indigenous Peoples Day, and they are Vermonters. But now there's a group that's come down from Canada, and they're questioning the validity of these claims. I don't know if any of you have seen any of this. Well, it was in the Brave Little State did a podcast. OK, so that's how you heard a little bit about it. But I don't, but it was very hard to Okay. To, to understand why, what was really going on. Okay. Even though it was well explained. All right. It's complicated. Well, yes. But I started do, digging into it a little bit. And it seems like maybe the Odenaks have some financial and strategic support from Hydro Quebec. Ah. This is the piece I was looking for here. Because in the not too distant future, Perhaps there will be a, a lucrative land claim, and they will be able to do this. Are you getting it? There are many articles, as you said, in Vermont Digger and uh, back and forth. But in February of this year, the Vermont House and Senate adopted a resolution commemorating a Stowe's woman's donation of 350 acres to land in Wheelock. I just drove through Wheelock yesterday. Um, and that will go to the Nohegans. And then in May, both chambers declared support for the state-recognized uh, tribes. So it seems like the legislature and our leaders, our congressional leaders, have all supported the Vermont group. So my question is, why is UVM stirring this up each year? I don't get it. I don't know enough information on that. But, but they seem to be. Many institutions are also dealing with land acknowledgments. Have you heard about that? OK. For example, at Middlebury College, at certain events, they read this statement. We pause to acknowledge the Middlebury College sits on land which has served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples since time immemorial. The Western Abenaki, they pronounce it differently, are the traditional caretakers of these Vermont lands and waters, which they call Indakana, or homeland. 
We remember their connection to this region and the hardships they continue to endure. So that is often read at events to acknowledge that the Abenaki were, were here be before. And then, as you know, we now have Indigenous Peoples Day. And Vermont is one of the states that recognizes this. And I noticed that President Biden did certify it, but it's not a national holiday yet. OK, so you're aware of that. All right, any comments on indigenous history or questions? You already had one comment. No? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Um, I attended a conference at Harvard last Ooh. year about reparations to Native Americans. And they were asked the question, there were various tribal members there, particularly the Wampanoag were in Massachusetts. Were. And the question was asked, how do you feel about these land acknowledgments? And the land agent of the Wapanoic said, we know what you did. We'd like to know what you're going to do about it. <laughs> so there is now a movement to have an action step. Connect, if you, if you make a land acknowledgment, to have an action step associated with it so that people can offer support. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, Unitarian Church in particular, as land acknowledgments always, but now they're adding an action step to it. So, you know, it, it does feel just to say something is kind of lame. <laughs> no, I think, I think you have a very, very good point. If, if you're going to acknowledge it, then what if someone claimed it? Yeah, no, no, you, you, you've got a very good point. Yeah. That's why some colleges are backing <laughs> off doing it. I was on a committee with CCV and I noticed we didn't get anywhere. And that's probably just what you're saying. What, you'd better have some action steps before you start talking about land acknowledgement. Yeah. So we'll see. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, the timing seemed as if the rise of the eugenics movement in Vermont coincided with Coolidge acknowledging his own indigenous heritage. And I wondered if you know, did Coolidge have any opinions about the eugenics movement? Um, basically, no, I don't have anything on that. But remember, he died. He didn't have a post-presidency. So he didn't live into the modern era, I have to be honest. He really didn't. And as many of you know, I'm much more of an expert on Grace Coolidge. And Grace, <coughs> definitely, we can channel her for a minute, would have been outraged. And she's the one who wanted to adopt Jewish children. Um, now, granted, it's not the same thing, I understand. But she was very aware of being open, open arms to um, any group she can get a hold of. Coolidge, thinking though with your question a little more, Coolidge is the one who did say that Native Americans could vote. Now, I know you can laugh at that if you want, but he acknowledged them as citizens. Um, and he was willing to wear his bonnet, as I showed you. Um, but no, the eugenics movement was a little past uh, his time period. You probably saw that, right? Um, it, was, it was 30, 31, and, and it's past his, his time period. So he didn't get into that. But there were some good people. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. There were some very brilliant people involved in eugenics. Margaret Sanger was one. She thought, uh, birth control, let's give that out. Are you getting it a little bit? Um, so there were some people who really thought eugenics would be, would be a wonderful thing. Once they saw the Nazis taking it to the extreme, though, they all backed off. Yeah. Governor Mead, I think, just had his name removed from Middlebury College Chapel because of his uh, support for eugenics. Is that right? Yeah. OK. Well, that makes sense. Me, me chapel, you know, okay. Well, we're going to be seeing more of that, I think. All right. Uh, we'll move on to African American history. I begin this section with a couple of slides asking why we didn't have black history in our textbooks. I answer those with this kind of fun picture. You can laugh if you want. That um, after all, 
uh, basically, if you don't make history, so to speak, you won't, you know, you won't be recognized. And in my book, I should say, I tried to focus not on victims, not on the enslaved, not on the Underground Railroad. I know a lot of you are interested in that. Um, there are plenty of books on those. And of course, there's some racism <laughs> discussed in my book. But I tried to, to um, find uplifting stories to, to focus on, because it, it's easy to find the other ones. They're pretty, pretty obvious. Um, and those will keep coming out, I'm sure. And as you know, Vermont did have its constitution with banning of slavery in 1777. I'm always t telling my students this was a very exceptional, unbelievable constitution. Um, it, it just was very, very good to see something like that. Um, and my students do constantly go back to it and say, you see, Vermont was so early with this whole philosophy of equality. And I, it's nice to see that they feel that way, I think. OK, I focus on a few. I'll tell you about a few in my book. I can't do everything because we'll be here all day. Um, but uh, Lucy Terry Prince is one that I like to talk about. And she was freed from bondage by her husband. She made history because of a court case. Yet she participated in the story by being in the court herself. She argued her case in front of the Vermont governor. She and her family had been harassed by neighbors in Guilford, and she had had enough. She traveled to Norwich in 1785 to ask Governor Thomas Chittenden and his council for protection against these neighbors. After listening to her story, he ordered the selectmen to defend her family, and if they did not help, the family would fall on the charity of the town. When she inherited land in Sunderland from her husband and was denied the deed, she appealed to the state Supreme Court in 1803 and won, and she argued against the two leading lawyers of Vermont. She probably is our first African-American poet in, in America because she wrote Barr's Fight about the Native American raid on Deerfield, Massachusetts, where she used to live. So she's quite a first. And I quote historical figures in my book because I want them to speak for themselves. And also, I wanted to point out all the firsts that ha happen. And the, my next one was Marion Annette Anderson. And she had Native American, African American, and French heritage. Her father, William, was an enslaved man who left the state of Virginia with a Union soldier returning home to Vermont after the Civil War. William married Philemon Langlois, a Canadian immigrant of French and Native American heritage, and their daughter was born in 1874 in Shoreham. Nettie, as she was nicknamed, did well in Vermont schools and then went to Northfield Seminary for Young Ladies in Massachusetts. Once there, she flourished. Oh, you might want to know which one she is. She's this one. Okay. Oh, by the way, the people who helped me write my book were the archival people. Um, and Northfield gave me materials, and Middlebury gave me materials, and so I was able to put together Nettie's story. Um, she flourished. She went into the diploma course. She became the class president and wrote the class poem. She was in the half of the, of the class who was eligible to go on to college. And so she was the first African-American woman to go to Middlebury in 18, 1895. When at, when at Middlebury, she earned entrance to the Pi Beta Kappa Society. And then she was the first African-American woman to get that honor. And then it's fun to talk about her graduation day. Commencement at Middlebury, Middlebury College, a town holiday, was quite a day in 1899. The townspeople had seen many male graduates of color in the past, about 10. I'm hearing that. <laughs> but in the parade from the college to the congregational church, the class valedictorian was a woman of color with a remarkable record of achievement. She had written the class ode, which they sang that day, and gave an address entitled The Crown of Culture. Wearing her honor society key, she proudly accepted a cash prize from a Shoreham doctor who had promised her this sum if she graduated at the head of her class. This she had done. The local newspaper never mentioned her race. Nettie Anderson broke many barriers for women and obtained these first for herself. Um, 
So she is one that I, I do like to talk about. When I was up at the Shoreham Historical Society, I kept pushing them to put some kind of marker up, but I don't think I've achieved that yet because her brother Will was quite important too. All right. I, when I gave this talk a few years ago, I was asked to put together a list of some of the first. So you'll see them in my book, but here are a few of the first for Vermont and sometimes for the nation. And I think in the newspaper they had Alexander Twilight too. He was the first to graduate from a college. Middlebury again. If you notice, Middlebury is pretty progressive in, in this history and first to serve in the, in the legislature. And then Martin Freeman of Rutland, he's the first um, black professor. So there's, and there are more firsts too. So that's, that's kind of fun. But then uh, those of you who know me know that I'm gonna do more research, so I did. <laughs> and I found Edna Hall Brown, and I thought I'd share her story with you. Uh, she went to St. Johnsbury Academy for a year and then enrolled at UVM. She had come from Baltimore all the way up to Vermont. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree, went on to get a master's from Teachers College at Columbia, and then went to her hometown of Baltimore to teach science in the school system until 1970. She didn't forget UVM. She willed funds to the school to be used for a scholarship fund for minority students. That scholarship name for her is used for students to this day. So there's a woman, the f a first, who remembered to provide funds if she had them for others. I thought that was important to put in. All right, and George Aiken. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard of that fellow. Um, the Civil Rights Act, in many people's minds, would not have passed without George Aiken. And that's a story worth telling, I think. Um, do you remember it at all? Um, it, it was uh, 1964, oh, I have that, 1964 for you. It banned employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And in public facilities and federally funded programs. And restricted discriminatory voting requirements. To give you a little background, Senator Aiken was a rumpled, smiling, wildflower farmer from the hills of Putney whose political career began with his passionate talks about wildflowers, of all things, to garden clubs in the state. That's how he got to be known, talking to garden clubs. He went on to become the 64th governor, and then he was in the Senate for 34 years. He was well known for talking to people on both sides of the aisle, and he had breakfast with the Democratic leader, Mike Mansfield, on a regular basis. He did support desegregation. In terms of business, he wanted a strong Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and equal access to employment. But he also believed in private personal rights. To pass the Civil Rights Bill, he suggested that the Mrs. Murphys, now that's the landladies, who ran small boarding houses all over the country, should be able to rent rooms to whomever they wanted. He justified the compromise as allowing Mrs. Murphy to decide whom to allow in her home because the stranger at her door might be dangerous, inebriated, or worse. Aiken did not want to force the landlady to admit a person who could be unreasonably intrusive and that permitting her to find congenial tenant, a congenial tenant had nothing to do with color or gender. The final legislation did prohibit discrimination but allowed some leeway if the building contained not more than five rooms for rent or higher and was actually occupied by the proprietor. Thus ended the longest filibuster in history, 54 days. Closure was achieved, two thirds of the Senate, and the Civil Rights Act was passed. And there you have Aiken. He's right here, I think. Summer in Vermont criticized his compromises offering only near equality to African Americans. But the ever practical Senator Aiken countered by insisting it would be better to have three fourths of the legislation passed than nothing at all. So I think it's important, um, this isn't in my book, but as I said, I've done more research and this should be in because of what he did. And when you think of it, it was probably working behind the scenes a lot to do this. Okay, jumping into more modern matters, 
We have the Black Lives Matter marches in Vermont. Most of you have seen all those signs. It seems like now they're sort of being put away, but it was 2020 when George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota had been uh, uh, arrested and one officer knelt on his neck for nine minutes. Since this was on video and circulated, many Vermonters had protests. And so this was one of the protest uh, marches. One of the political candidates um, a couple of years ago suggested there's a school to prison pipeline. And I, that really was curious for me. And I tried to find out what that meant. Evidently, a, the ACLU in Vermont found out that black students are more than twice as likely as their white peers to be arrested at school. Numerous studies suggest that students who are suspended or expelled from school are more likely to end up in jail. David Zuckerman was the candidate, and he suggested more training for police and teachers to prevent discipline out of proportion with the student infraction. So that, that's something to keep in mind. OK, and just recently, you all passed this. Most of us thought that slavery was banned in the Vermont Constitution. I just showed you the Vermont Constitution. But there was an exception clause that a person bound by law for payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like can be a servant, slave, or apprentice. So you all voted in this change to the Constitution. And then I should mention there's been new history. Esther Charleston won the Democratic primary this August. Did you all take note of that? Mm -hmm. No? OK. Yes. Oh, yeah. She is a first generation Haitian American who moved to Vermont from Rhode Island in 2019. She worked at Middlebury College and Middlebury Union Middle School as Dean of Culture and, Cl and Climate. She left the middle school in 2023, said, that there were shortcomings in the school district's ability to support her as she encountered racism. She is co-chair of the Vermont Commission on Women and former Middlebury Select Board member. She now says she's a strategic planning consultant. She says she's running for Vermont 20 years from now, and it starts today. <laughs> so probably you'll hear a lot more of her campaign, I would imagine, coming up before November 5th because she's made history. We have, you'll see in my book, we have had uh, African Americans run for other offices, but, uh, and we had Randy Brock, remember, run for governor, but we haven't had a female African American, or uh, in her case, Haitian, um, run, run for office. So she's made a first, so I have to add her to the list. Okay. What was her name again, Cindy? Her name is Esther. Charleston, and it's spelled Charles with a T I N, Charleston. Okay. And what office is she running for? Governor. Governor. She's running against Phil Scott. So you're probably all nodding who would ever run against Phil Scott. <laughs> but anyhow, she is running and she won your primary, so she's off and running. Sadly, uh, what? the report on the voter turnout for the primary this year is abysmal. It's absolutely abysmal how few people, and I blame part of that on what the media did not do. They really did not advertise it on the news. There was nothing really in the paper saying primary day is coming up. Make sure you, you know, plan to vote. Make a plan to go vote. It was it was sad when I went. I live here in Bridgewater, and I went to the town hall. <laughs> They were all there twiddling their thumbs because the turnout was so very low. It's, um, yeah, it's a shame a lot of people aren't aware of. There's not a lot of contested races this year. Do you think this will translate to November? No. No, no they're no. saying no. Be no. Because it's a presidential yeah. election. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the down ballot will also get a lot of attention. But, you know, here, and. And um, part of that, that primary was it included Bernie Sanders and others. I mean, it was, it was important, you know, but people just didn't go. I don't even think they were aware that the day had come and gone. So, so she is the Democratic candidate. 
She's yes, the yes, she's the Democrat. And I had her picture, but it didn't come through yes. the computer somehow. You could, but you can find her picture, I'm yeah. sure, pretty easily. She's very, very interesting, and she presents really well. She's, okay. she's a good speaker, and she's beginning to put her platform out there. So, you know, definitely take a look. Mm -hmm. You know, I know it's like, in the right mind will run against Phil Scott, but well, it's the, worth taking a look. Uh, uh, running against Phil Scott, still, you have a platform and you can speak and right. you can educate people. And that's what I've always said to candidates when I talk to them, is you, here's your chance, talk mm -hmm. and educate, tell right. people things and they'll, they'll learn something. Right. And that's always, always good to do. All right, other comments on African American history? I was looking through African American history and, and you do have someone that wrote in your Bridgewater newspaper before the Civil War. Um, and I'm trying to think of his name right now, but anyhow, so there's more to be done um, on African American history. Always, wherever you are, there's more to be done. Okay, women's history. All right, yeah, question first, yes. On the uh, aspect of uh, Vermont abolishing slavery in mm -hmm. uh, 1777, Zadok Thompson mentions in his book that the Dana firm in North Pomfret, and I'm very familiar with that firm, uh, had three slaves and named them. And David Moore has shown me three stones where he believes they were buried. Now, did they just, did locals just call them slaves, but they were in fact not? What's going on there? Well, uh, you probably know that Armani Whitfield's done a lot of research, some of you do, and, and he said that there was a bit of slavery in Vermont. It just wasn't very, um, very much discussed because it was so few um, people. And since the rest of the nation, you know, until New England states started banning slavery, which they did, since the rest of the nation had slavery, it was, okay, so you have slavery. Um, it did take the abolitionists in Vermont to really um, wake everybody up. And in my book, you'll see, uh, I talk about the, the uh, abolitionist movement. Oh, you'll see a picture in a minute, too. Um, and they educated people about slavery. But still, there were people in Vermont who thought, oh, we could develop a colony in Africa. That would be a good plan. So there, there was still racism. Um, and then some historians feel that Ethan Allen did have a couple of uh, quote unquote slaves of color. So, you know, there, there were, were some, it was not well reported, we're still working on that kind of research, um, but it's, it's feasible is the answer to you. It's feasible. Yeah? Aren't there at least 10 slaves enumerated in the 1790 census in Vermont? That sounds interesting, okay. That sticks in my mind from some earlier project. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Uh, did the uh, abolition of slavery have any uh, impact on the migration of uh, fugitive slaves coming north? I mean, was Vermont a, a magnet uh, a destination, or was it really not well known that slavery was, uh, was abolished? Oh. Vermont was a destination. And if you go up to Ferrisburg, have any of you been up to that museum? Some are nodding, yes. You will see some of this history. Um, up there in Ferrisburg, uh, slaves would, would stay and would work and be in Vermont and pretty much feel safe. But some of them didn't, and, and it, you can see that in my book. Some of them didn't, and they moved on to Canada. Canada. They felt safer in Canada, but some stayed for quite a while. So yes, is your answer. Some African Americans felt fairly safe, and you heard about Nettie Anderson, uh, uh, but that was after the Civil War, of course. Um, so th there was some safety, but also a feeling among some, well, I better just get to Canada. That's a better bet. So, it was it, so it's interesting, that history. Okay, other comments on this? No. All right, women's history, the other half of the story. All right, women's history has a different focus. And my publisher of, of my book uh, used to, or still does to a degree, like to have books on places, like women in Bristol, Rhode Island, um, 
Native Americans in Maine, stuff like that. So the, it, my book was extremely unusual. I don't know why they agreed to it, really. Um, but <laughs> because I, I'm trying to deal with three stories, so to speak, um, and, and three histories. So if you look at women's history, it should be a little bit different focus. Um, instead of looking for people who were only in politics, we, we have other categories. And remember, pretty much women were not in textbooks unless you were Clara Barton or someone else like that. Um, and then they were just sort of put in, I don't know, for those of you who are old enough, they put little boxes on the side. There was Clara Barton, you know. Um, and there were no courses in women's studies <coughs> until the 70s. And women were valued if they fit into the, to the story um, dominated by men. So we, we didn't really have much women's history. I strongly believe if you're denied your history, you feel you don't belong. And I wanted to restore this history so my students, because about half my students are women. I don't know if you realize that. Community college students are, in many cases, half of my classes or more are women. Of course, I have to add one compliment to men. My male students love my class so much, so, so don't, don't worry. They're right there. Um, but if we don't know this history, we might know, not understand why women didn't have the vote until 1920. We might not get it. So we do need to know that story. So that's why I took a whole chunk and put in women's history, even though there were women, Native Americans, women, African Americans. All right, a couverture. This was a legal and religious system brought from England. A married woman was covered by her husband since she had no independent standing. She could, and this is the list, my students, I have them memorize this. She could not own property. She could not sign a contract. She could not keep her wages if her husband wanted them or keep anything more than her clothes. Her children were not hers. They would reside with her husband if there was a separation. If all went well, the security of a husband or father was wonderful. If this went asunder, a woman had no rights. Only single women or widows could own property or make contracts. Once married, women were placed into a cycle of pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, and this recurred every two to three years. The average family had eight children. And when I've done some research, and I bet some of you have too back into your genealogical history, I look back at my ancestors, there were always eight kids in the family, or nine, or whatever, always a big number. Some women did rebel against these societal and religious rules and laws. After all, well-behaved well women seldom make history. That was Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's comment. So I looked for the rebels in Vermont, and I didn't have to go too far because right up the street, born in Plymouth, Vermont, is the famous Axis Spray. Now, how many of you have heard of her? Not too many. Well, you can go see the marker. It's right up there. <laughs> well, another field trip, Polly, another field trip. All right. Um, she was considered the foremost spiritualist in New England in the 1850s. A trans lecturer, she communed with the souls of her dead neighbors. She was a medium who claimed, claimed to deliver messages from the spirit world, to lift her listeners to new heights of awareness. She thought herself under the control of divine and mystic energies. When she spoke, it was a full house. The independent woman in the guise of a trans speaker enthralled her male audience. So the men thought she was wonderful too. She dressed up, here's her and she closed her eyes, she put her arms out, the spirits were speaking to her. It was sort of like an actress, you know? Um, and this is before any kind of TV, movies, or anything like that. Uh, she also had a wonderful view. She focused on the needs of poor and inmates in prisons. She was one of the first to blame the social scheme and evils of liquor for crime. She denounced slavery. And, and as I said, there is a marker there now. If Calvin Coolidge hadn't been born in Plymouth, she would have been the most famous person there. And I used to walk up to the cemetery and see her grave, which uh, 
says, I still live. <laughs> and when the towns of uh, people came to me and said, which graves should we work on, Cindy? I said, Axis Sprague should be your first one. Because the Coolidge ones were all fine. We didn't have to worry about them. Um, so AXA is, I think, important to remember. You can go on the internet and you can read a lot of what she wrote. I mean, it's, did you realize tons have been, tons, have been poured into the internet? And she didn't have a very long life, but she really had a lot to say. There's a fictional book about her, too, um, which I didn't like that much. Um, but anyhow, she's a, she's a fascinating person. And here is the marker, so you don't have to walk up there if you don't want to. Um, I got it for you. So there you go. Another woman of this time period was Emma Willard. And somehow her picture got to the Vermont Standard, but it didn't get to my slides for some reason. She had this revolutionary idea that women could master the same college level subjects as men. Middlebury College at that time had males in attendance, and it, be, it didn't become co ed until 1883. And she opened her school in 1814 and had females learning scientific and classical subjects. Yet her goals for women were very traditional. You were to be first moral and religious, second literary, third domestic, and fourth ornamental. <laughs> she knew her female students would become mothers, not movers and shakers. Their education would help them raise sons to be in the society. She asked Vermont to support her work, but they didn't. So she turned to New York and moved to Troy, New York. And she's, there's still an, an Emma Willard school. And one of her students was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the famous suffragist. So Emma Willard is someone to really think about, though, when you start studying her. I was down at the um, Library of Congress, and I went to the map room. And there were Emma Willard's maps up on the wall. And people with me said, why do you know about this? I said, she was one of the earliest map makers. She could do 3D before there was 3D. I mean, you know, she could figure this out. She was really, I think Emma Willard probably was an absolute genius. If you start looking, go on the internet, you can see some of the work she did. She had the first textbooks for women and men in American, in American history and in geography. So she was this very, very brilliant person. I have a question. Yeah. Well, they were all somewhat religious, I have to put it that way. But Emma Willard School is not religious now. No, no, no. No, but I meant that it's found well, but it's in New York. Probably was, had a religious aspect. I don't have that in here. The only reason I'm asking yeah. is because I went to a, a very old <laughs> girls' preparatory school in the okay. Midwest. Okay. And it claims to be the first secular girls' preparatory. I um, see. Okay. So I'm just curious about these different historical claims, but because um, this would actually say that it was founded before the school I went to, but my school claims <laughs> it was the first. Well, there there probably was a, a religious aspect. You know, yeah, Wellesley, Wellesley College. Versus the, uh, Wellesley College was founded by Henry Wells Durant. And he also had very much a Christian, it was a Christian college. So often they were very, very Christian. Now, Christian's kind of broad, but, but still, they, they often had a seminary um, approach, yeah. Because yeah, they, Mount Holyoke was, it's the other one that's cited as the first secular book. Mm -hmm. It's Mary Lyon, no, I've forgotten what her first name is, Academy, yeah, which became Mount Holyoke College. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That was founded in maybe years. So I think there is a secular, somewhat of, there must be this religious distinction here, secular versus right. religious. I mean, some of the other famous prep schools in New England were Episcopal. There's a lot of you know, St. Mark's, you know, St. And um, so it's just a little technicality, but I was curious about this. 
Yes, many of the schools were started with a religious aspect. Right. That was considered what you did, yeah. what you did. Right. It was right. part of the education. I mean, I didn't talk about Alexander Twilight, but he had religion in, in his school too. I mean, that was just part of the curriculum. But Charles wanted to mention something. Yeah, just, uh, I, I, I went to Middlebury, uh, and in the late 50s, early 60s, there was a, a chapel requirement. Uh, yeah. three, three times, uh, uh, you had to go uh, six times uh, in, in, in a semester. And it was, it was getting abused uh, pretty much. Uh, some people would go uh, go to a, um, uh, a Jewish uh, 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 Friday night, uh, Sunday and Saturday, um, uh, two, uh, two Catholic uh, masses on Sunday. <laughs> to, to, uh, so that uh, it, soon after I left, the requirement was dropped. But, uh, but Middlebury was never a religious school, but it was it was founded by congregations, and uh, they and uh, they, they, they wanted people to uh, to be religious. Now I don't think they threw out Presbyterians in the 1840s because they were Presbyterians, but uh, uh, there was always a religious element. Right, and you saw from my talk so far, very much Middlebury has been extremely progressive with yeah, these first that with these first that I have. Uh, all right, finally, we get to the Ferrisburg couple. Um, in my classes, I make sure the students understand abolition, temperance, and suffrage. The abolition movement, as you probably know, was, was to end slavery in America. Women were not treated equally in the anti-slavery society, so they started their own. And they started having petitions, appealing for legislation. They wanted to end slavery in the District of Columbia. They wanted to end the slave trade and end the legal status of slavery. And Quakers would not buy anything made by slaves. And this is the Ferrisburg couple, the Robinsons. Uh, they provided a safe haven for slaves before the Civil War. Rachel taught the fugitives to read and write so they could start lives in Canada. And women in Vermont organized cent societies, that's C-E-N-T, to fundraise one cent per week. And then they would save that to help uh, the slaves. They wrote bylaws, voted in officers, organized meetings, and they were becoming political actors. And that's why the abolition movement is important. The most popular movement was the temperance movement. And this is a uh, painting by um, Thomas Waterman Wood, who's also in my book for his art, his sympathetic art on many topics. Here's the bartender telling the, the wife uh, the, no, I, I, what am I supposed to do? Your husband's drunk and he's lying on the floor there. And she's got a baby strapped to her back. Um, since married women could not control the finances of the family, they watched with horror as their husbands drank away their wages at the male-only bars and inns. There was a state prohibition law in 1852, but it was ignored. Um, and some societies were organized in towns. And in 1875, the women in Burlington and Montpelier created the Vermont Women's Christian Temperance Union. Back to Christian again. The women of St. Albans were so fired up that they marched through the streets and asked hotel owners and saloon bartenders to stop serving alcohol. This was a baptism of power and liberty for women. They even created an educational law in Vermont. And Norwich had a lovely water fountain put in because they thought water is life and there's no need to drink anything, right? The other popular movement um, was espoused by Clarina Howard Nichols. Um, the, she was the earliest advocate and here's her marker. She grew up in West Townsend. She expected to have a very good marriage to an educated man. Her husband was a Baptist minister, but mistreated her. She could not, and he, he, he could not hold down a job. She tried to support the family. She gave up and was got fed up when her husband tried to kidnap the children. She divorced him in 1839 and began writing for the Wyndham County Democrat newspaper. At the paper, she was writing, editing, and she married the editor and owner. She got very political. A friend invited her to go to Montpelier and speak before the legislature in 1852. The chairman of the education committee is quoted as saying this, 
If the lady wants to make herself ridiculous, let her come and make herself as ridiculous as possible and as soon as possible. She wanted women to have the right to vote on school matters. One of the legislators was going to present her with a pair of pants, since women like her like to wear pants in the family. Clarina heard about his idea, and before he could act, she stated that even if she brought, bought her own dress, her husband owned it. She taunted him, don't tease her about wanting to wear a man's pants until men give up their right to own a woman's skirts. The men, believe it or not, the men stamped their feet in approving of her joke. So the men did approve of her comment. She became a national lecturer. She advocated for suffrage for women and moved to Kansas and wrote their constitution. The other woman that I featured was Annette Parmley. She uh, thought women should vote in municipal elections, and that was obtained in 1917 for taxpaying women. She was ahead of her time when she said there should be equal power at home. Equal rights mean equal responsibility, equal justice to working men and women, equal pay for women who do work, equal to that of men. She also organized a drive to have Vermont be the final state to approve the 19th Amendment. This would legalize the vote for women. The Vermont governor at the time would not call the special session, and when it was proposed, he vetoed it. Vermont did not land in the history books. Tennessee did. It could have been Vermont, she kept saying that, as the 36th state to approve. And here's what happened when you let women vote, right? With the husband's home with the crying babies. And even the cat bites him. That's what happens. And there's some women advocating for the vote. And then we have the present day. Look at her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Before the pandemic, there were some positive initiatives. In 2018, Vermont had the strongest responses to the Me Too movement and protected uh, its interns and contractors from sexual harassment. Abortion is a big issue, still is, in many states, but not in Vermont. Vermont is the only state with no restrictions. Did you know that? Only state. Vermont is one of 16 that uses public money to fund medically necessary abortions. It is now, we now have a constitutional amendment and it reads that an individual's right to personal repro reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. And many of you probably remember the march after Trump was elected. Here you have 15,000 in Montpelier. And then uh, this is a smaller march that was to get an amendment added to the Constitution. And of course, we still have the wage gap. Vermont women are 91% of what men make, but the national average is 82%. And Governor Phil Scott just announced that there would be a Vermont Family and Medical Leave Insurance Plan, a voluntary paid family and medical leave program, and that will be announced in 2025. Because remember, he, he vetoed um, the other proposal. And Janet Yellen has said we should have equal pay for equal work because such a policy would boost the economy and reduce poverty for single parent families. And we also have pre-K in Vermont. All three, four, and five-year-old children in the state have a right to free publicly funded pre-K. The schools are only required to provide 10 hours of pre-K but 68% of the providers do have a, a full day offered. And th this has put Vermont at the top in terms of publicly funded programs, and there is very high uh, participation. And of course, gay marriage. Vermont was one of the first states to introduce civil unions, it was the first state, I should say, in July of 2000, and then as you can see in this article, 
uh, Vermont moved along and went past having civil unions and had same-sex legislation. The Senate and House passed a bill in 2009. Governor Douglas vetoed it, but the two houses overrode the veto, and Vermont was the fifth state to afford legal recognition to same-sex marriages. In 2021, a public religion research institute poll said that 80% of Vermont residents supported same-sex marriage. So it's popular. OK. After this coming November's election, women could come in just shy of a majority in our state legislature. Think of that. It's a rarity. Only Nevada has that. But it stretches beyond that. In the past two years, Vermonters have elected the first woman in Congress, Becca Ballant, here she is, the first elected woman attorney general, Charity Clark, the first woman as mayor of Burlington, Emma Mulvaney Stanek, and Sarah Copeland Hansis is the third woman Secretary of State. So Vermont has done very, very well on many of these metrics. So I thought I would just read my conclusion of my book. It's, by the way, it's not millions of pages. It's just a couple of paragraphs. And then see if you have other comments and questions. From the opening poem to the last sentence in this book, I have tried to give a voice to the voiceless. When possible, I've quoted from poems, sermons, speeches, to show how articulate and thoughtful most of these people were. Their own voices merit inclusion in Vermont state history. Since I teach it, I am aware of what should be in a survey course and the importance of covering all you know, the basics. But also in our curriculum, students are asked to evaluate the significance of ethnic and minority groups in the state and interpret the experience of Vermont women in different historical periods. Hopefully, a more detailed history of these topics will be an important um, addition. For those readers who have studied Vermont, I hope this new material will enrich their view of the state. I have been inspired to highlight the past fugitive moments of compassion, not the victories from wars. And I have not focused on victims, rather on change agents. Those people who have made a difference to their gender, their race, or their family band, have been the most exciting and meaningful stories to tell. Hopefully, all of us will be richer from the mining of these stories of hope, frustration, and striving for excellence. So that was my conclusion.